I walked about the chamber most of the time. I imagined myself only to be regretting my loss and thinking how to repair it. But when my reflections were concluded and I looked up and found that the afternoon was gone and the evening far advanced, another discovery dawned on me. Namely, that in the interval I had undergone a transforming process. That my mind had put off all it had borrowed off Miss Temple, or rather that she had taken with her the serene atmosphere I had been breathing in her vicinity, and that now I was left in my natural element, and beginning to feel the stirring of old emotions. It did not seem as if a prop were withdrawn, but rather as if a motive were gone. It was not the power to be tranquil which had failed me, but the reason for tranquillity was no more. My world had for some years been in Lowood. My experience had been of its rules and systems. Now I remembered that the real world was wide, and that a varied field of hopes and fears, of sensations and excitements, awaited those who had courage to go forth into its expanse, to seek real knowledge of life amidst its perils. In the middle of the 22nd century, mankind has reached a point in its technological advancement to enable colonisation of the far reaches of the universe. Armed with artificially intelligent thermostellar triggering devices, the scout ship Dark Star and its crew have been in space alone for 20 years on a mission to destroy unstable planets which might threaten future colonisation. Dr Lecter is about to savour a fig, holds it before his lips, his nostrils flared into its aroma deciding whether to take all the fig in one glorious bite or just half, when the computer game beside him beeps. It beeps again. Whiteout turning his head, the doctor palms the fig and looks down at the child beside him. The scents of truffle, foie gras and cognac climb from the open box. The small boy sniffs the air. His narrow eyes, shiny as those of a rodent, slide sideways to Dr. Lecter's lunch. I suppose that only a single mountain top, the hideous monolith crowned citadel whereupon Sithlu was buried, actually emerged from the waters. When I think of the extent of all that may be brooding down there, I almost wish to kill myself forthwith. Johansson and his men were awed by the cosmic majesty of this dripping Babylon of elder demons, and must have guessed without guidance that it was nothing of this or of any sane planet or at the unbelievable size of the greenish stone blocks, at the dizzying height of the great carved cavern monolith, and at the stupefying identity of the colossal statues and bas-reliefs with queer image found in the shrine on the alert, is poignantly visible in every line of mate's frightened description. One afternoon, when Noddy was out walking by himself because it was such a lovely day, he went in to be careful wood. Its name was a very good one because you just had to be careful in that wood. All kinds of queer people lived there. There was Pop-Out, who lived in a big oak tree door. When Noddy went by, Pop-Out behaved like his name. He popped out of his tree with a yell and gave Noddy such a fright that he fell over. Bump! Another queer person who lived in the wood was Mr. Stumps. He could make himself look like a stump of an old tree. And when Noddy sat down on the strange little stump, Mr. Stumps began to crawl away with Noddy. Oh dear, what a shock he got. He got up and ran away very quickly. The day was young and the earth was in a joyous mood, having its occasional spin. All of a sudden the earth felt a rope around him. There were humans in the sky. The earth was astonished to see that they were fighting over him. With the help of his friends, the moon and the sun tried to restrain the two human beings. However, through all of this madness, the earth just saw the funny side. Through a gap in the forest, the night looked down upon the roofless shell of the black house studded with fires and jewels. And above the gap, floating away forever from the branches, was a small green grass balloon, lit faintly on the underside. It must have come adrift from its rooftop mooring. Sitting upright on the upper crown of the truant balloon was a rat. It had climbed the tree to investigate the floating craft, and then courage mounting it had climbed into the shadowy top of the globe, never thinking what the mooring cord was about to snap. But snap it did, 
and away it went, this small balloon, away with the wilds of the mind. And all of the while the rat, little rat sat there, helpless in its global sovereignty. White Tree, Sam thought. Please let this be White Tree. He remembered White Tree. White Tree was on the maps he'd drawn on their way north. If this village was White Tree, he knew where they were. Please, it has to be. He wanted that so badly that he forgot his feet for a little bit. He forgot the ache in his calves and the lower back and the stiff frozen fingers he could scarcely feel. He even forgot about Lord Mormont and Crasta and the Whites and the others. White Tree, Sam prayed, to any god that might be listening. All wildling villages look much alike, though. A huge weirwood grew in the centre of this one, but a white tree did not mean white tree, necessarily. Hadn't the weirwood at white tree been bigger than this one? Maybe he was remembering it wrong. The face carved into the bone-pale trunk was long and sad. Red tears of dried sap leaked from its eyes. Was that how it looked when we came north? Sam couldn't recall.